I can also feed it the facts at the time rather than having it deal with its foggy memory. So if I can give it the set of facts, then I can eliminate the hallucinations as well. So those combination of things, it's basically if I can have the LLM either, I can tell it your preference is the information that I'm supplying to you. And if you genuinely don't know, say you don't know. That combination ends up with a very low, low hallucination output. Hi, this episode is sponsored by Salonis, the global leader in process mining. AI has landed and enterprises are adapting, giving customers slick experiences and the technology to deliver. The road feels long, but you're closer than you think. You see, your business processes run through many systems, creating data at every step. Salonis reconstructs this data to generate process intelligence, a common business language. With process intelligence, AI knows how your business flows across every department, every system, and every process. With AI solutions powered by Salonis, enterprises get faster, more accurate insights, a new level of automation, and a step change in productivity, performance, and customer satisfaction. Process intelligence is the missing piece in the AI-enabled tech stack. Search Salonis, C-E-L-O-N-I-S, to find out more. Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is I on AI. This week, I speak to Ed Enough, Chief Product Officer at Datastax, about vector databases and their role in AI applications. We explore how retrieving trusted data into large language models addresses the hallucination problem. Ed explains the growth and demand for vector databases and key factors like production costs, and benchmarking relevancy. I hope you find the conversation as informative as I did. I have been over at, uh, at, at Datastax uh, for, for the last uh, close to uh, four years now, a uh, couple, of, couple of months short of that. Uh, prior to that, I was, I was at Google um, for, for about, uh, about four years. Uh, and uh, joined uh, Google when it acquired Apogee, which was was the API management uh, company that um, uh, I was part of for for a number of years. Uh, I've, I've worked in a variety of uh, companies, enterprise software, as well as um, things like blogging software and uh, and uh, you know a few uh, few consumer things as well. Um, so I've, I've been in tech for uh, for a long time now. Uh, uh, originally an RP, RPI graduate, Rensselaer Polytechnic Ooh. Institute way back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, what, what, what made the move to, uh, data stacks? And I'm curious, I mean, vector databases in particular, uh, are all the rage right now because of the hallucination problem with LLMs, but what, what was data stacks doing before the GPTs came along? Well, so, so, so we make, um, uh, the Cassandra database. Uh, the, it's a very popular open source uh, database that is designed for scale out data. And, and Cassandra is the database that's used by Apple, by Netflix, by Federal Express, by any of a, of a large number of companies that, that need to deal with, with scale out data that, that they're distributing to users on a global basis. So, so part of the attraction of, 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 uh, of, of coming to DataStax was, was the fact that um, you know, it, it was dealing with very large data sets and, and the, the goal was, you know, to, to make that data available for, for AI and machine learning, um, use cases. And then, and, and that was something that we were already well underway on, uh, a number of our customers were well underway on, obviously the, the, some of the users that I mentioned, um, are very well known for for you know their use of, of predictive AI, for example, Uber as well also uses Cassandra. Uh, it's one of their primary databases, and they've published a lot of great uh, research papers and uh, uh, and done a lot of talks about how a lot of the predictive AI that, that powers the Uber application, uh, you know, is built on top of Cassandra. So our, our goal was all, always to bring that to the customers, and 
um, as part of the product. And then in the middle of that, generative AI hit and, and, and obviously has, has really sent everything into overdrive. Yeah. Uh, Cassandra, what kind of a database is that? So it's a NoSQL database. Um, it is, you know, similar to databases like like Mongo and uh, Couchbase or DynamoDB or some of these others, which means that that it, you know, although it does let you use a query language like SQL, standard query language, which is what most relational databases use, um, but it's more designed for situations where you're dealing with large amounts of data and the data schema change can change or can be very flexible at runtime. So you find a lot of the, these types of databases became very popular for the large internet services, Google, Facebook, Amazon were really the pioneers of this type of database. And Cassandra itself spun out of a project at Facebook. Uh, and, and the technology was open sourced by Facebook. So, so that's where you tend to see this type of, of technology uh, is where, where people are dealing with large amounts of data that they're using in their interaction with, with their end users. And uh, the, um, I mean, I've got a few questions. Um, so the, uh, the data stacks builds itself is a real time uh, data company or real-time database service company, uh, or I guess you build on-prem as well. But yes. uh, uh, is is that exclusively for um, now that we're dealing with Gen AI for vector databases? Uh, how different are vector databases from Cassandra? And, and uh, why this sudden shift that I'm seeing to vector databases from from other forms of storage so a couple a couple of different questions there so so first you know we do talk about ourselves as a real-time uh, database we do so in the context of AI as well and, and the reason is because Cassandra is designed for very high throughputs of data you can write to the database very quickly but more importantly that data is immediately available for, for reading as well. And it turns out that becomes really important in, in Gen AI, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, uh, along the way, um, what we saw, and basically starting last year and, and going into this year, is that a new application um, pattern emerged, uh, and it was inspired by, by ChatGPT. And mm -hmm. It's, it's, I think we've all experienced ChatGPT, so it's useful to sort of start with that because it helps explain why vector databases are important. When, when you show up at ChatGPT, um, part of what makes ChatGPT interesting is not just the question and then you get a response. It's, it's actually the chat part of it. So you ask a question, it gives you a response, you ask it for some elaboration or Perhaps you're having it help write you some code. You'll go and say, oh, that isn't exactly right. Could you make it do this? And so it has a sense of history. And if you know about how LLMs, large language models, work, they're completely stateless. The, the, the model itself, when you ask the model a question, it doesn't change. That, that model is frozen. Uh, it can later be tuned or retrained, but the model itself the data comes in, it actually can be represented from a software development standpoint, it's a very simple black box. I have an input, um, which is often called the context or the prompt, which is a yep. form of context, and then it has a response. Um, so where do things like the history come from? Where do, you know, those actually come from a database. And so, so ChatGPT has a database that sits next to GPT-4 and it, knows the history, it captures the response, uh, and it's able to, to, to create a personalized conversation with you. And that, that's sort of where the magic happened. And then um, OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, did a blog post in December of last year, because at the time they really, they weren't fully in the ChatGPT business. They, they actually had launched as an example. What they were really trying to do was get people to use their models. They wanted you to use GPT-3, they want, want you to use GPT-4. And so they said, if you like this thing that we've built and you wanted to build your own, what you need is a database that sits well with the large language model. And oh yeah, part of what helps that database sit with the large language model is if 
it is able to store and query vectors because the vector is the numerical representation of essentially the, the concept. What, what it does is it takes that whole string of text and it reduces it down to a very, well, I say reduce, but in some cases actually it can be much larger, a very long multidimensional number that represents what that word or phrase or sentence or paragraph it reduces it down into a context and and or um, uh, concept concept semantic concept and that's how LLMs think they don't really literally think but but they they represent these the, these uh, you know what we consider ideas or concepts they represent it in a large multidimensional space and it's the distance between things in that space that says how similar or different they are. Yeah. So, so this is an important capability that 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 lets a database work well with LLM. Now, there are some other uses for vectors. Some databases have been supporting vectors for other reasons, basically for doing better search results for for a while. And some of those were among the first crop of of databases that people started using with LLMs. Um, all the other database vendors very quickly followed suit. By by this time, we're almost a year since, uh, you know, a couple of months short of a year since since OpenAI wrote that blog yep. post that kicked off this whole thing. And at this point, most major databases have some some vector facility because it becomes really important. There's lots of people who are building these types of applications in enterprises and startups and, and so on and and they need databases, they need a database that can work with these models. And that's why you're seeing everybody talking about vector databases. Sorry, that was a little bit of a long response. No, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, that really clarifies it quite a bit. So for Datastax uh, at this point, when did you introduce vector databases and, and is your business, uh, you know, 60, 40, uh, with with uh, traditional database, relational ah. databases and now vector databases. <laughs> where, where is the future of the database business going from your point of view? So, so really good question. So we introduced the vector capability, you know, since we're built on top of open source, we were able to get the code out there very quickly early in the year. We had it live in our cloud service um, in April of this year. Hmm. Um, and... We're at a point right now where 40% of new signups, people coming to our cloud service, uh, are doing so for vector uh, for vector usage. Um, actually, actually, let me amend that. Actually, uh, it's actually more than half are using it for vector usage, uh, and uh, about 40% actually have never used Cassandra before. So they're completely new users who came to the service because they were looking for, for vector databases. So this is pretty important for us. Now, I, I, you know, I suspect that some of the other database companies are seeing similar stuff. I'm, I'm, I, I'd love to say, oh, we're uniquely suited. I do think we've got some, some you know, great important capabil capabilities that others don't have, but I also do. I, I think you know that that the bigger point is that there's a major catalyst this year with people trying to build these types of applications, and it's causing them to go and and rethink what databases they're looking at and evaluate different databases and and so on. So so long and short of it is that's why you that's that's why you know if you're following the database industry. The entire conversation is is around vector databases because new application types don't come out uh, that often. The last time, last time we had a new application type of of this level was probably mobile, and mm -hmm. and that catalyzed a whole bunch of stuff. And then prior to that was probably e commerce and websites and you know the web itself. And and you know you start to get that hyperbole as to to the but but you know. Uh, you know, I've been around for a while. I'm, you know, I'm sure you've been following this this stuff for a while. You, we all have seen this thing where there's a new application type, and companies rush to respond to it, and it really changes everything. And 
um, you know, within the database space, again, probably the web. And then prior to that, probably client server being like the, the biggest catalyst. So, so very important to us, long and short of it. Yeah. Uh, I, can we back up just a little bit? Uh, because I want to talk about some of the, the products, but uh, yeah, I definitely. have questions about data that I, <laughs> I've never yes. satisfied myself with <laughs> answering. Um, you know, I, I, I was close for a while to a company called Labelbox uh, that, that is a platform for labeling data. And it fascinated me. This is, uh, you know, during the supervised learning, yes. uh, when, when that was the, the, the dominant te technology in AI. And um, in, in reading uh, and understand I'm, I'm, my background is not as a technologist. I was a foreign correspondent covering politics and, you know, conflicts and stuff like that. Uh, so, so the but the amount of data that's being produced is increasing it seems exponentially i don't have the numbers in front of me uh and uh so you're, you when you talk about real time data it's it's uh it's you know writing and reading data on uh in real time but presumably some of that data then gets stored for uh for long-term uh, usage or retrieval, that it's not being retrieved uh, frequently, but you don't want to lose it. And I, 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 where does all this data go eventually? Because it's not being erased. Uh, and, and at the time that I was looking at this, there's kind of a hierarchy where it gets moved from one medium to another until it's finally on... Uh, literally tape drives stored in a mine shaft somewhere. But do you understand that? Where does this data go? Uh, and and is, it, uh, is it being accumulated uh, to, to the point that, uh, that, that someday we're, you know, we're, we're going to, there's going to be more data than any other artifact uh, in the world. It probably already is. Long and short of it is um, it somewhat, somewhat depends on the use case and it really ends up um, there. There's two pieces to it. There's, there's sort of cost and policy. Yep. Um, and um, depending on the systems and depending on the, so first of all, you're correct in your basic statement, which is particularly when we talk about real time, um, you're capturing data, you are, perhaps doing analysis over, over ranges of it, you're keeping it around. Um, and, and you are accumulating it. And a, lo a lot of companies do accumulate. It. And the question then becomes, um, how long do I keep it for? Um, in some cases, depending on what you're doing, the, the cost of getting rid of it might be uh, less than the cost of, of keeping it. Uh, the cost of storing data has has dropped uh, over over the years, and uh, and so so what ended up happening was a lot of companies, particularly in the internet age, just kept on accumulating that data um, because again, querying and deleting a range of data is actually from a computation standpoint, from for the process of doing that, um, be just as expensive as writing that data. Right? So you're going, to, it could be much more actually, and and then the cost of storing the data can be very low. So then. Then you see a lot of companies just go and say, "Okay, we're we're just going to keep this data," uh, um, just because. And it's it's more. It's not like a. It's 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 not a. In as much as a business decision, it's more just like okay, the costs of doing something, we'll get around to it, and maybe they do it on on certain basis. Um, then you have sort of the the policy questions, and the policy questions come from from either um, business or regulatory. And, uh, and so, so then you have the questions of, in some cases, some policies require you to retain the data for a period of time. Other policies go and say, you shouldn't retain it. Many people on like corporate email systems and so on, things are auto deleted after 30 or 60 days, right? For as a company policy, because if that's mm -hmm. your standard policy, then you don't, you don't have the data, the, you know, the, then the data isn't there and, and so on. Um, um, and, it, and it may not be desirable to keep it for, for various reasons. 
So, so that becomes a whole decision point in and of itself. Um, and, uh, and then there's security reasons as to why you don't want to keep data around for a long period of time as well. Uh, you know, and so, um, you know, for example, companies that are very concerned with privacy actually make it an advertise. They advertise that they don't retain any data, personal data whatsoever. Uh, and, and, and so there's a whole set of, of things around that. Um, and so, so the long and short of it ends up being that it, it, that you probably could look at a hundred different companies with their, their, uh, you know, data retention strategies and, and find a hundred different answers. Um, because a lot of it will have to do with the quantity that's being accumulated and, and, and the cost associated with it. Um, the, the companies that, that, and, and the ones you, that, that we talk about, for example, like financial statements and things like that, that only get, you know, updated and aggregate, um, you know, on a monthly basis. That, that's why, you know, you can get, you know, for example, a bank statement. They, they increasingly made it, it becomes harder to do because they shift it from, from you know, to what's essentially called cold storage or, or you know, less accessible forms of data. But they still keep it around for, you know, 20 years in some cases if, I, if you need to, to get something. Whereas, you know, the, the internet companies that are capturing and literally storing a row in the database every time you load a, a page view because they're doing it for personalization and ad tracking purposes, those, those they, they, they will collapse and compress and, and create summaries and delete the rest. And, and the interesting thing is, is that those summaries end up getting created, you know, through ML pro that actually ends up being an important usage of machine learning is to go and condense those, you know, 10,000 clicks into something that they can then just store and they can delete the records of the previous 10,000 clicks. Right. Um, so it, it is a whole thing in and of itself. I, it, 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 you know, I, I don't think there's sort of a one size fits all, all uh, strategy on that. It, it, it ends up, as I said, ends up being with how much data you're dealing with and how quickly it's changing. Yeah. And, and so with data stacks, uh, is there a drop off then that that a, a, a customer can set that there it's reading and writing but after a certain period of time it goes into some sort of a storage bin uh that's a little more difficult to access or how how does that that work well so that you definitely can do that there are a variety of mechanisms too but but it actually gives me an opportunity to 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 um talk about one of the the cool features which is we do actually have the ability for at the, at the individual row level in the database and it's pretty unique to cassandra that you can make the data expire mm. and as a consequence you have lots of of um users of cassandra that that take advantage of that and they just they, they they're like okay I only care about this data for a month or whatever. And then after that, I don't want to have to go through the problem of crawling through all my data and checking each row and saying, oh, is it older than this amount of time? Let me delete it or whatever. Well, rather than that, the database just automatically does it. It just drops it off of the database. Um, and so then, then you have this data set that always contains your last 30 days and, or, or whatever the period of time that, that you want it to be. Um, so that's one that that is that and and why that becomes important is that again where you get into these situations is where you have these very large sets of data and, and it is one of the areas where we play and where, where Cassandra is uniquely suited is is for the the extremely large data sets. Yeah, uh, on the the my familiarity with uh, vector databases comes from addressing the hallucination problem with LLMs. Uh, and a lot of companies are building a vector database. Even after they tune an LLM, they still have this hallucination problem. So they build a vector database with trusted uh, data, and and the LLM becomes simply a, a language interface. Is that uh, how Datastax customers are are using your vector database? Yeah, so that that is a description of a process called retrieval augmented generation, or or uh, we often hear it called RAG, 
right? So if you're at a conference, an AI conference or something, everybody will be like, oh, rag, rag, rag. And you're like, what is this? Um, uh, and it, so it's, it's, it, it is this process of, and as the name implies, retrieval augmented generation goes and says that, that the generation is, that's the name would apply, being augmented by retrieval from data sources that are fed into the LLM at, at the point of inference. And in fact, what you can do is tell the LLM that it should only consider the knowledge that is supplied to it at the point of inference. In some cases, it's just to supplement it. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to hallucinate, if you really want to eliminate hallucinations, you just go and say, look at, use, use your reasoning powers, but don't use your knowledge. And the reason is because one of the aspects of hallucinations is there's a lot of causes of hallucination, but one of them is that that the LLMs have a, a foggy memory, if you will, right? Just like humans, they, they um, although pre- perhaps a different mechanism, although um, not that different a mechanism, but that would be an entirely different conversation. The 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 you know the so so rather than it going and trying to 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 you know remember exactly, you're like here's the set of relevant content, choose among them and and choose among these things and and give me give me an output. Um, and you do that for two reasons. As you said, it's trusted, but there's also an imp- other important piece of that, which might be um, that it's also, um, you know, sensitive. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, you could have an LLM that is providing you with with medical information, medical, uh, you know, uh, you know, a medical recommendation, um, and you don't want the language model fine-tuned on a set of electronic medical records. The, the LLM is not good with private information. Generally speaking, anything that goes into the LLM, it's going to leak out. Yeah. Either, either inadvertently or inadvertently. There's no way that you put access control on the knowledge that an LLM has. You could do something convoluted, which I see some people say is, oh, I'm going to have a second LLM uh, spill the beans and filter it out. But now you're getting to this Rube Goldberg architectures. Um, It's much better to just supply the LLM with that sensitive information as it needs it. Remember, an LLM has no memory in and of itself. So I can say, here's Ed asking a healthcare question. And, and here's his electronic medical record. And the LLM looks at that, goes through and says, you know, well, uh, you know, Ed, you, you know, probably, you know, need to exercise more because, you know, as, as I, you know, you know, your weight has gone up in, you know, over the last six months, right? But it doesn't remember that fact. And then later be in a conversation with Craig and say, hey, Craig, you know, you want to exercise more because you don't want to end up like Ed. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> like, I don't want I don't want the LLM to know anything about Ed when he's talking to Craig. And I don't want it to know anything about Craig when he's talking to Ed. Right. So so that's an other piece of it. Now, the other aspect of it is, again, I can also feed it the facts at the time rather than having it deal with its its foggy memory. So if I can give it the set of facts, then I can eliminate the hallucinations as well. So those combination of things, it's basically if if i can you know if i can have the llm uh either i can tell it your preference is the information that i'm supplying to you um and if you genuinely don't know say you don't know that combination ends up with a very low low hallucination output a lot of these things are more art than science um which is frustrating to many as they're building these systems um, and you can make it more exact. Again, we've done this. We do this for, um, uh, we have an AI uh, co-pilot that helps you use our products. And what we've done is we supply content out of our documentation uh, into it. And we tell it, you exclusively use that. And then it gives a result that is that doesn't have any hallucinations. Now, we also do a little bit of fine tuning as well, but but if you really want to eliminate the hallucinations, it, it's a good mechanism. Yeah, uh, and right now, uh, I, I I know you have a product called Astra DB. Uh, is what what is uh, your your primary product, and what are the use cases that people are are turning to it for? 
Sure. So we um, we have a cloud product called AstraDB, and uh, we also have a, a self managed software that people can run themselves called DataStax Enterprise. And they're both built on top of the the Cassandra open source database. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our our fastest growing product is the cloud product, as one can imagine. We have we do have many many enterprises actually. Uh, the majority of the Fortune 500 is using DataStax Enterprise, running it in their own data center. Both of those groups are very very interested in in the vector database capabilities. I, I talk to, to, so it isn't just the ones in cloud. I, yep. I talk to customers every day that are doing things with, with their, you know, sensitive data that they need to keep in their own data center. Um, but, but yeah, uh, you know, most people who are new to, to our, you know, our, our product and our company um, do come to the cloud service. They come to AstroDB, they do, you know, a sign up. And they're just right, you know, within, you know, within a couple of minutes there that they are able to create a database and, and connect it to their applications. And the type of applications that people build are, are all over the place, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, applications that are powering mobile apps, applications that are powering websites, applications that are being used for, for you know, things that are, are controlling uh, you know, Internet of Things devices. And as I started out by saying at this point, uh, you know, for, for brand new people coming to the service, the number one uh, catalyst, uh, you know, is is generative, a- generative AI. Uh, that may, you know, maybe that'll, that'll, you know, even out or or slow down over time. But but I do think that just I think it just has to do with the number of new applications people are building in general that that a lot of that focus is AI related right now. Yeah. Uh, the, um, um, does, does the suite of products include the, the vectorization of, of, uh, data because, uh, you know, in order to put it in a vector database, yeah. they need to be vectors. Uh, so that's, that's a really good question. So, um, what we do is we actually do have the capability within the products for being able to use open source uh, open source models. Um, the selection of the model that you use for the vectorization is actually a really important decision. Some people want to use OpenAI. Some people want to use uh, you know Google's models. Uh, some people want to go and use open source models. Um, the uh, the different models all have different costs associated with it. Um, and as a consequence, uh, you see that, that this selection process, people will use a smaller model for vectorization because it's, it's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So, so we enable all of that. As I said, we do provide a, you know, an open source model where, where that makes sense, but majority of people are, are using, you know, they're, they're, they're using something like OpenAI, or they're using one of the Google models. The, those tend to be the preferences. Yeah, but on your platform, you have those available, or does someone have to? Well, there's. Yeah, I mean, we 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 let you integrate your account. Yeah. You can yeah. go and, and put in your your OpenAI account. For yeah, um, and, and yeah. I've been writing recently uh, about the cost of inference and. Uh, and rate limits on uh, on large language models, which are constraints for enterprises. Uh, does yes. using a vector database lower the cost of inference, and does it uh, reduce uh, the number of tokens that you're you're uh, uh, putting into or pulling out of a, an LLM because you you've you've got the data vectorized already someplace else. Yes. So it depends on what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, if you're doing a simple search use case, they, the vector database can be a very good substitute be, uh, for being able to go and take a natural language query, meaning a sentence that somebody's going to ask and give you the result. But it'll be a search result, meaning that that if you're asking a question, about, you know, for example, 
you know, what, what is the statue, you know, somewhere in the center of my town? Um, it's going to give me a standard answer, mm -hmm. right? But what it's going to do is it's going to understand the, the question. It's going to turn it into a vector. And then it's going to give me a result that'll give me the top result or however many results I want. But generally, it'll give me the top result. Uh, it tends to be the way people build these things out uh, that, ma that matches that question. So that gives me a little bit of the AI experience because I'm able to ask this human question mm -hmm. and then I'm, but then I'm getting standard response. If I want that response to be customized, the vector database can't write for you. Right. What the vector database can do is it can read for you, but, but writing that response is then I need the language model. And so this ends up being one of these things that people look at for knowledge bases, for example, yeah. where they're like, you know, I don't really need a GPT personalized response to every every query. I just want to give that result. And somebody goes and says to me, you know, asks, comes in and asks a question, you know, how, how do I, you know, whatever, you know, uh, you know, change channels on my TV set. I just want to get that stock answer that that says you know that gives me the page from the the reference manual on the remote control right um but i want to handle the person asking that question uh, one of a hundred different ways including in different languages the vector the vectorization the vector query process handles that very well um and so so yes as a low-cost option you see that uh, you see that sort of thing quite a bit uh, but but it really depends on, like I said, how much of how much of are, are they trying to do of having sort of a full conversational AI experience? If you need that, then you're going to invoke the model at least once through every interaction. Yeah. Um, is so I would imagine that this business is growing leaps and bounds. Uh, you were saying forty percent of all uh, new signups are are for. Use yeah. with an LLM. What what kind of growth are we talking about? Well, so keep in mind um, as we talk about these things, uh, the usage growth is 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 pretty dramatic. Yeah. Um, but but the interesting thing is that um, a lot of what people are doing right now is experimentation. So this is one of these interesting things as we talk about vectors and vector database and business growth. And obviously, you know, we're running a commercial business. So, so I have this type of conversation all the time with, with, you know, investors and such, and they, the, who are looking across the database industry, right? Like the, and, and they go and say, how soon are we going to actually see one of these public database companies return announcing their results and see, you're going to see huge growth. And I said, well, you know, we're probably another six months away from that because what we're seeing right now is a lot of experiments. Right. But it, we're, we are all what are all every database company is what's called a consumption business. If, if people aren't actually using it live on their website and their business processes or whatever, they're not going to be consuming more. They're not going to be consuming more, you know, database software. They're not going to be consuming cloud services. They're not going to be consuming open AI. It's like, like, you know, that will all come from this stuff going into production. So what I would suggest for people as you're trying to look and understand this stuff is, you know, sort of look at the world around you. As you go into this holiday season, you're going to see, you know, we're, we're about a month away from Black Friday, which is the Friday after Thanksgiving, largest retail day of the year, right? Um, and I genuinely don't know the answer to this. I, we're working with a number of those retailers, and many of them are, are working at break, breakneck pace to try to get their stuff live. But but as I said, something that, that sort of everybody who's listening to this can do themselves is sort of pay attention to that. Like when you go to, to you know, when you, when you start doing your shopping, um, you know, is there is there an agent on the, do you see a, a conversational agent on, on the website saying, hey, what can I help you with today that lets you do a, a chat conversation and is suggesting products to you? As you? By this time next year, very highly likely you're going to see those on the majority of websites, just the same way that when we saw the mobile transition, right? Remember that, that, you know, you saw, oh, it took about 18 months for, but it was a steady progression. Everybody was like, Hey, try out our app. And you'd started to do it. And now we're at a point 
right now where if you're like me, the majority of stuff that you buy, you, you know, from the store down the street, you know, you, you're going and looking at it like Home Depot, which, by the way, is a data stacks customer, runs everything on their e-commerce site, uses our Cassandra database. But if I'm going to go and get something from from the Home Depot, I've got, you know, ho- you know some DIY, I've got to fix something. Um, and I'm trying to figure out which, first of all, which, which store is closest to me and which one has that thing in inventory and what uh, and, and what aisle and row that it's in, you know, uh, all of that I do through the mobile app. Right. And so so we'll see, we're going to a lot of us think and, and with, it, you know, with, with a lot of evidence that we're seeing a similar transition to AI. And so what that means is over the next few months. You'll see a set of companies that do this and the rest will, the majority of them, in fact, because we have what's called the crossing the chasm. You've got the early companies that do everything first and then mm-hmm. and then the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, but you'll see a few of them race out over the next couple of months with these types of AI services. And the expectation is, again, over, over the next year, you'll be every website you log into, every mobile app that when you open it up, you'll see you'll see various forms of this sort of personalized AI experience. Some of it will be classic chat. Some of it will be a little bit more. That's one of the things I often get people asking me, like, does it all have to be via chat? The answer is no. It actually can be done in a variety of different user experience Mm -hmm. modalities. But you start to see these things and you'll be like, oh, that's AI powered. And and I think... um, I think that's going to be the, you know, we're going to go through this process where it's pretty novel right now, but then it'll just become a standard thing. Yeah. Mo- keep in mind, the majority of the AI hype that we have experienced this year has been experiments. You definitely, right. pro- you know, I suspect if you're like me, majority of the interactions you do, majority of things you buy online and so on right now, you're not seeing Gen, a- Gen AI in the loop on them. And that will change. That'll change pretty dramatically. But and as it does, that's when you're going to see the business growth. We're already seeing the usage growth, as I told you right now, in terms of signups. But but what are people doing once they sign up? They're building their demos, yeah. and the demos don't use a lot. Right. They so they neither they neither consume a lot, you know, nor nor are they paying for anything yet because they're not they haven't launched these services. Yeah. Well, actually, that's why I've been interested in in rate limits in particular because. Yeah, uh, and for listeners that don't know what rate limits are, the, the the LLM companies limit the number of tokens you can use per hour, let's say, uh, and that limits uh, how how you can scale. And so uh, there's been a lot of experimentation, not a lot of enterprise. I shouldn't say not a lot, but but uh, it's mostly experimentation. And the question is, will Will this rate limit, which is directly related to the availability of GPUs, which we all know are, you know, all sold out? Uh, how how do you increase the? How many of these experiments will succeed in in going into production? Do you have Do you have any sense of that? I know it's off topic from what we're talking about, but. No, it's actually it's 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 very on topic, and I get that question quite a bit because again, the, these these questions, a lot of folks are trying to figure out what is the what is the size of the vector database market. So I have variations of this conversation all the time with analysts, and you know, both industry analysts like Gardner and Forrester, and financial analysts who are trying to make recommendations of which database stocks to buy and all that. And so what we know is this, we know that the cost of, for a similar amount of data um, and and a similar amount of retrieval, and it doesn't matter which database you're using because we benchmarked them all. Um, there is a significant amount of compute used in doing a vector retrieval. It is almost 10 times the amount of compute that, that a regular database query would do. And so that, that's an increase in cost. Some of that compute is GPU-based compute, uh, but but there's a lot of work being done to shift that to minimize the amount of GPU compute that, that's necessary. And in fact, you know our systems can do uh, all of the the in fact they do all of the vector retrieval without GPU compute. Mm-hmm. 
So, so um, that's not true of all the vector databases, but but majority of them are moving in that direction. We actually get a lot more requests in the opposite direction, which is is if we want this to be even faster, can we use GPU compute, even though it is it's scarce. So, uh, but so the compute is expensive, and so doing Gen AI. It has, it has an expense. And what we then go and say is, okay, as we look at that, everybody's doing these experiments, but probably some subset, probably anywhere from one in three to one in 10 actually have the business use case that justifies right. it. And when they do, it's not going to be a 10X cost. It has to be a two to five X cost. So, so where we look at what we're doing and again, when I say 10x cost, we 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 benchmarked everybody and we averaged it across uh, across what every every you name it. Like you can throw names at me all day long, and we did we 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 worked it into our, our benchmarks. Um, uh, and because uh, we needed to know this, where we are a database data at scale company, so so all of our customers are very focused on cost. So what I think you're going to see is that. You know, every vector database company is going to be talking about and and commenting and innovating around cost and performance. For example, we we created a piece of technology called J Vector that uh, is built on top of Java because that's the language we use mm -hmm. that dramatically cuts the cost. And I, I know that you'll see similar approaches or announcements from other companies because they have to. So we have to get costs down. Um, but even with that, you also have to have the use cases that actually drive a performance a, a business outcome, right? So going back to that's often why I use some of the retail examples because they will they are the the retail industry tends to be and the variations of it won't literally be people selling product it might be people selling travel, but they have the outcome measurements where they're able to go and say oh we delivered this AI recommendation service and we converted, we got this much more business. The companies that don't have that are going to struggle because AI is a nice to have, no matter how cool and innovative it seems, it has a cost involved. And we're seeing this already. You know, people come and say to me, oh, I use ChatGPT and it was slower or the answer wasn't as good. Um, did they change something? And my response is, I don't really know what goes on behind the scenes there, but I, I say, look, what they've said has been that they haven't changed their model at all. So what I think that they're doing is they're doing things to control costs. Right. And and some of the things you do to control cost, what people perceive as quality and relevance from the model is not always a property of the model. It can be a property of the vector database you're using. It can be a property of the of the type of compute you're using. A similar thing, you go and see that that you know Microsoft recently with their some of their very popular co-pilot services, mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, it's costing them more to provide it than, than, than what they charge users for. And so they'll also be, so all of these, these companies that, you know, the big, the big tech companies that have been rushing AI, AI out, they can do that and they can operate at a loss. Most enterprises won't do that. They will, they may, they might operate on an individual request. They'll lose money, but what they'll have to be able to go and say is our overall sales increased by X percent by using this model. And that increase of in, that increase of revenue that we got has to be greater than the amount we spent. Right. Very similar, very simple lemonade stand economics. But but that's the way enterprises, you know, uh, need to operate um, or, or they're going to get beaten up on, on Wall Street. Right. So so. You know, we're going to see that. And this is what we call the production filter. And we talk about this a lot, which is everybody's looking at Gen AI and this is the year, year of experiments. And it should be like people should be getting out there, learning what this stuff is good for. That's the only way you can figure it out. But the production filter will be a much smaller set of those will be the ones that you see live on on the websites or or live in in whatever format makes sense for the business. A lot of this stuff is is stuff that won't actually be presented directly to the user. It might be something that your customer support agent that you're talking to, they're using a Gen AI based system that's giving them stuff to tell you, right? Uh, 
uh, or 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 how to process a claim or something of that sort. So so yeah, that that the cost will be one of the biggest gating factors. Yeah, probably second to cost will be hallucinations, but but it'll be cost by a long shot. Yeah, and and to be fair too, we're we're only a year in um, the the GPT three GPT four. Um, era and uh and a lot of the you know everyone's working on uh reducing costs or increasing token they, they, yeah exactly they have to look i'm old enough to to remember you know the web 1.0 days yeah. when when you know startups were racking and stacking uh sun microsystem servers and cisco routers and all of that and and you know as much as people sort of complain about the, you know, irrational exuberance of the tech industry and, and all of this stuff, the reality is that we've all seen these situations where, uh, and it's baked into the institutional memory of most of these companies that, that, that you can only get, you know, so far ahead on your skis in terms of, 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 uh, you know, of this stuff. And some of the big and the big tech companies can can afford to operate at a loss as they do these things. But even when they do it, they're doing it in very careful, measured ways uh, to, to make sure that 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 it's something that they have a path to, to sustainability and, and, you know, and profitability around. And all of the enterprises that I, I interact with very few enterprises that are like, that are, that are going and saying, look, we don't care how much it costs. We just want to get this thing out there. They're, every one of them is going and saying, uh, you know, okay, what is this going to look like at production? And frankly, actually, this is one of the ways that we're able to actually gauge as we're talking to one of these companies, our way of gauging how close are they to put it into production ends up being is the cost conversation happening. If yeah. they're not talking about yeah. cost at all, then what we know is they're still just basically experimenting, yeah. which is okay. But but obviously, as a business, you're always trying to figure out how, how far along is are, are these folks, you know, in terms of of, of of where they are as customers. And so one of our checkoffs checkboxes as we're going through this is like, okay, are they starting to ask the hard questions about what does production costs look like? And then and we want to get them there because we know that they're not going to go live until they go through that process. Yeah. Obviously, I think you know we as a company have very good answers for it for that stage of it. But we know that 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 they have to be asking those questions, right? And so, yeah, yeah. Well, I you know I've, this conversation I've been kind of following my my own uh, interest, which is not necessarily the most sophisticated uh, train of uh, of thought. What what have I not talked about that that you'd like people to know about data stacks? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I've dropped a few pieces into it. We we do feel, you know, Datastax has been the company that has served most of the companies in, you know, in the Fortune 500 on their digital transformation journeys, meaning when they went to mobile they and they had the scale that they had to deal with, you know, data stacks and the Cassandra database were, was the database that was your production, reliable production at scale and at a cost basis. We've been the company that powers that and, and the brands I've, draw, I've name dropped in the, con, in, in the course of the conversation, you know, whether you're using somebody like Priceline, whether you're using somebody like every time you scan a package or, or, or for that matter, every time you track your package on Federal Express, every time they scan the package on the 20 different or 100 different points on its journey. All of that is 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 going through Datastax's databases. Every time that you, you know, you use Netflix, that's using the Cassandra database, the open source Cassandra database. Uh, Apple is uses Cassandra as well. So so Cassandra and Datastax have played a really important role in making this data available at scale. And we've done all of the work to make it not just the best for those types of database use cases, but for vector database use cases. And so I think you've asked all the right questions, which are, are what happens when you put the stuff into production? What does it end up costing? You know, what, what are the challenges around dealing with these large amounts of data and preserving the relevancy around it? And, and as people are thinking about this stuff, 
you know, I, I always recommend, you know, make sure you try everything. But the one thing that isn't hap- happening enough in this conversation, in this AI conversation, is the experiments are great, but asking those questions about what happens when I go into production. And when you look at the vector database, as you pointed out at the start of this, there's every database company seems to be talking about vector databases. Make sure that you are thinking about what are the, what is the cost, the reliability, the accuracy, you know, the performance of this stuff into production. Otherwise, you're going to have a really cool experiment that, you know, looks really good. And, you know, maybe you presented it to your board of directors and everybody's like, ooh, ah, but it'll just be, you know, it'll be just the AI equivalent of the concept cars that, you know, that Detroit used to wheel out. Right. It won't be actually something that you're actually able to get out there and have impact on your business. on. Yeah. Uh, just on, on that last point, uh, are there benchmarks that people should be looking at uh, uh, if when they're evaluating uh, databases? There are. There are standard benchmarks for relevancy and recall. And you should also be asking, you know, you should be looking at as you look at the databases, we're publishing these now, and I'm seeing other people are too, but it's not widespread yet. So, so I would definitely ask, you know, a database vendor or database provider, whether it's an open source database you're looking at, or whether it's one from a vendor, I, I would go and ask to see the benchmarks and just, a, a, the, not just from a performance standpoint, some of these benchmarks are also related to relevancy. There are standard tests that are done to evaluate the relevancy. Not all vector databases are created equal in terms of of the relevancy of the results that they get. And that is something that you will end up discovering as you build this stuff out yourself. Most common thing that we see is somebody loads in uh, a bunch of data. And by the way, relevancy also changes with the number of records in the database. So any of the vector databases, when you're doing that little test where you load in a couple hundred or even a thousand you know, data entries, then you go and, and so you're like, wow, this is really good. And then you go and load in a hundred thousand um, or more. And then you start to see this drop off. And at that point, you're in a real bind. And so we, I, you know, we think that's going to be important. Certainly as, as we spend the next 18 months with people putting these projects into production, you're going to hear a lot more about this. And and it, it already is a topic that you see on blog posts and articles and people write like you see these how to improve your rel- your the relevancy of your vector results. You're going to see a lot of that. It's going to be the next hot button issue. Hi, this episode is sponsored by Salonis, the global leader in process mining. AI has landed and enterprises are adapting, giving customers slick experiences and the technology to deliver. The road feels long, but you're closer than you think. You see, your business processes run through many systems, creating data at every step. Salonis reconstructs this data to generate process intelligence, a common business language. With process intelligence, AI knows how your business flows across every department, every system, and every process. With AI solutions powered by Salonis, enterprises get faster, more accurate insights, a new level of automation, and a step change in productivity, performance, and customer satisfaction. Process intelligence is the missing piece in the AI-enabled tech stack. Search Salonis, C-E-L-O-N-I-S, to find out more. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Ed for his time. If you want to read a transcript of today's conversation, you can find one on our website, ionai, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. In the meantime, remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is already changing your world. So best pay attention. <laughs>